So um, I think we should just go right ahead, and I'd like to invite our panel on stage, our industry panel. Um, we'll be talking to Ole Asbo Jørgensen from Oticon, Nikolaj Bisko from GN Hearing, and Thomas Evers Christensen from Videx. Um, please join me here on stage. And as I mentioned, I think it was... Um, well, welcome, uh, please. Um, I think it was um, uh, presented as a fireside chat. And uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's no fireside. Uh, we'll, we'll have to provide the warmth uh, ourselves. I'm sure you'll be able to, to, uh, to do that. Oh, oh, I'm sure someone, someone will be able to, um, to, to have the fireplace going on screen just to, uh, to yeah, to, to, to provide the, the correct setting. We don't want distraction. Right. Um, so I think now that we have the time, um, I think I'd like to have you guys uh, present yourselves. To talk, to give us just a few words about uh, about what you do and uh, and your background, just to set the stage, uh, please. And, and we'll begin here. Yes, uh, my name is Ola Espo. Uh, I'm from Oticon. I'm the president of Oticon, uh, called President Brand. Uh, that suggests that I am not an engineer, which is atypical for Oticon. I'm a businessman, I'm a candy cone. My, my primary uh, job is to ensure that uh, Oticon has the right product to grow and to ensure that these products go to market efficiently. Thank you. Next up. Yes, my name is Nikolai Biscard. I work for in Resounds, in the headquarters in Belarus. I have been in R&D all of my life, so to speak. Uh, but lately I have engaged in a number of projects externally to the company and mostly doing also political lobbying and supporting Torsten's great efforts. And this bear project that uh, we talked about a little earlier was one of the things I also contributed to getting going. Uh, and uh, new education or geology and a number of other things. So that's mostly what I do, but I lived all my life in the hearing aid industry, so it's uh, great. important to me, I have to say. Great to have you here. And last up, um, Thomas. So the name is Thomas Christensen. I've been in the hearing aid industry not all of my life, like uh, my colleague here, but uh, I think 22 years in total. I can say that I've been in sound-related companies all of my life. So I've actually been with Oticon previously. I've been with Boyd Care. I've been with uh, Gene Audio and now I'm with, uh, with Widex. So very diverse background within sound. And I'm, of course, an engineer. My okay. responsibility... Oh, okay, two, two out of three is <laughs> not bad. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, and and is, I'll... is a nice guy anyway. Right. I'll keep you company. I'm not an engineer either. So, uh, so we'll keep each other uh, company on stage. Um, are you all able to hear? I, I, thought the sound was a slightly low on some of the microphones. You're all able to hear what's being said? Can we move closer? Right. Yeah. You can okay. move closer. Right. So, um, to give us a sense of uh, sort of the current state of the art in terms of the hearing aid industry, um, could you give me a, an idea or, or the audience an idea of what are some of your most advanced products right now? What are they able to do that, that you are uh, quite proud of? Uh, and we'll, I think we'll do the reverse order now. So, so Thomas, please. Right. So if you, if you take the, uh, the latest edition from, uh, from Vitex called the uh, Beyond Hearing Aid, it's building on, of course, all the traditional uh, Vitex um, good sound, uh, taking care of the customer, taking care of the end user. And I think the, what are we uh, particularly proud of is probably the, what we call the triple connectivity. So going back a little bit, um, hearing aids had what was called a tilt coil uh, many years ago. Uh, it was used in venues like this. It could be used in cinemas, in big stadiums. It's actually used in many places still. It's a simple uh, magnetic system for transferring sound to the, to the hearing aid. We still have that uh, in the beyond because uh, many people still use that. Then we added some uh, years back a magnetic radio for transferring sound between the two ears. So you can do a lot of extra sound processing you can imagine if you have access to both ears and you can, tra you can translate sound or you can transmit uh, uh, parameters between the two ears. And then finally, with the beyond, we added also the 2.4 gigahertz uh, connectivity that enables us to connect to anything basically that has 2.4 gigahertz built in. So, 
that is just building on top of all the, I would say, normal, um, like, I mean, Uwe mentioned uh, different situations where hearing aids will uh, classify maybe different situations, change the uh, parameter setting or change the um, the sound processing in the hearing, depending on the situation, of course, uh, that's all built into to the beyond as well. Right. So, I mean, that is the latest edition. Okay. May we like? Yes. Um, <coughs> our most recent product is called Lynx 3D. So it's the third generation of this Lynx product group. And um, the former one was uh, particularly interesting because it allowed for connecting to iPhones. So this made for iPhone hearing aid technology is something we pioneered some years ago. And it enables you to have any sound that normally disseminates from the loudspeaker in the phone to come into your ears via a 2.4 gigahertz connection. So the most recent uh, model now features a new system that enables us to program a hearing aid at a distance. Normally you go into a clinic and you sit down and you connect the hearing aids to your PC and then you can sit there and tweak the parameters until you reach a satisfactory uh, setting of the hearing aid in accordance with the needs of, the, of this particular user. But the problem is here now that we sit in this kind of protected environment and we most clinicians do their best to test out <clears throat> how would it work in a more noisy surrounding and so on, but we can never really be sure that it works probably in another sound environment than the one you have inside the clinic. So, so what we can now do is we can tell the user if he finds it unpleasant or not effective, he can send a little text message to his clinician saying, I have a problem right now in this scenario here. Uh, could you possibly adjust my hearing aid, and he will then send a little sort of data set to him, to his phone, and from that phone he can now upload it to the hearing aids and, and readjust the hearing aid and hopefully uh, get a better amplification pattern for this situation he's in right now. And, and the, the, the nice thing is, of course, that you can get relatively immediate feedback in the situation instead of going back to the clinic trying to explain what the problem was, which is not so easy, actually. So this is, I think, our most recent innovation is to do this remote fine-tuning, as we call it. Thank you. And over. Yes. Uh, if you look at the uh, person with the hearing loss, uh, I think there are four over overarching needs. One is uh, to help hear better, uh, and uh, that will be said as being priority number one by most. Uh, but there's also convenience, connectivity, and uh, should we say, we say cosmetics often. It's just that, it, you know, another word for that it should be invisible. So uh, the job is to make a small, nice hearing aid we have, uh, in our latest Oticon Open, created something that uh, combines, uh, in a strong way, I think, the, the, uh, an answer to the four needs. Uh, we have uh, convenience, we have uh, small size, and, and the convenience is that it's rechargeable, and uh, it has the 2.4 gigahertz connectivity, uh, that means made for iPhone, and uh, uh, shortly uh, also, uh, the interface to Android smartphones, and uh, we have uh, created a, an internet uh, connection in cooperation with a company called If This Then That, that you can find on the internet. So you can create your, your own rules. For example, that uh, uh, with, via the smartphone, you go on the internet, you set up a rule, for example, that uh, when you start your hearing aids in the morning, it will say, well, good morning, you look fantastic today, or something similar. Not yours. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. And, um, and then finally, uh, solving the, the hearing problem. And um, the big innovation in Open is uh, the fact that it was we call Open Sound Navigator. And that is really uh, leaving behind the traditional way of handling uh, the situation in a noisy situ in a noisy environment, and typically uh, hearing aids until now have been designed so that in order to create a uh, decent signal to noise ratio, 
you uh, create a directionality or even a beamform in order to uh, focus on the speaker and basically the rest is noise. And when you, when you talk about, uh, you know, cognitive uh, challenges, you know, and we also heard that all the other senses also matters. That means that if I'm looking at Uber here and talking to him, uh, the rest of you is really considered noise. And, uh, and with Uticon open, we are able to keep access to all sounds in the environment. And that means that we can let the brain choose uh, where to focus and, and where to have the, the, the conversation. And that's due to the fact that we have a new chip on board that uh, is able to handle the data from uh, monitoring the sound environment 100 times per second in 64 channels. <clears throat> and I know that that may not be called big data, but it's significant data that is, uh, that is generated from, from doing that. So the processor we have, have developed is capable of handling that data and, and being able to kill noise as it arises instantly. And that's something that hasn't been seen before in the industry. Right. Thank you. Um, so that's the current state of the art for, for your three uh, companies' products. Um, which developments in the coming years are you most excited about or looking most forward to? There's a lot of talk about integrating uh, personal adjustments, digital assistance, other types of sensors, stuff like that. Um, which, which of these are you perhaps most interested in and looking most forward to? Uh, Nikolai, we'll, we'll start with you, please. <coughs> As I, I think Torsten, Torsten pointed out quite uh, clearly that even though some of the data we use today depicts the patient or the client to be of a certain type of hearing loss, we can see that the solutions people need are really very different. And I think building data sets that will allow us to use the client profile to target a solution that is the result of you know, the study of many, many, many successful cases and maybe some unsuccessful cases as well, should allow us to come closer to the personal solution that will be preferred by each individual. The problem today is a little bit that we know, honestly, not so much about how it works out there. We know a lot about the technology inside the hearing aid, but the, so the big data set on how it works out there, and I mean the research project that, that Uber talked about is also targeting that type of thinking that we need to understand better how it works out there. Unfortunately, some of our customers are not completely comfortable with this idea that we would like to tap into their customers' uh, data, and, and this is a challenge we need to somehow deal with because we will have much better chances of creating optimum solutions for each individual if we were allowed to get access to some of this data. I think this will be one of the frontiers we will explore a lot in the coming years. So gathering more data from, from, yeah. from the actual use. And like the BMW that, yes. example, you know. Right. That. Yes. So, so stop, stop, cut down on the over-engineering and, uh, and uh, beefing up the relevant uh, not, issue. I don't think it's over engineering. I oh, think that was the BMW. More, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think it's major. more like I'm not, targeted. I'm not suggesting anything about your hearing aid. <laughs> um, so, um, what, what are you most? Um, so, I, I would say about? I would say two things. It probably ends up being three when I'm done. Uh, but but the first one is I concur with with Nikolai on uh, on this uh, all about uh, gathering data and find useful ways of using these data and I'm, I'm very happy that we are continuing the efforts of uh, Jens Brehm that was mentioned by, I think it was Jan, on, uh, on machine learning because I think that's, that is not only in the hearing aid business but in many, many areas going to be uh, the next big thing. So, so that was one thing. The other thing is I think for those of you who are not so familiar with, with hearing aids and the, uh, the challenges in hearing aids, then there are actually and has been two main challenges apart from all the nice things we want the hearing aids to do. Then one challenge is uh, size, and Ole alluded to that with, uh, you know, his, it needed to be invisible mm -hmm. or close to. Uh, and the other one is power consumption, because we, we actually don't have really good power sources, uh, small power sources for, for hearing aids. All these wonderful devices that we use every day, all of us uh, have, of course, rechargeable batteries. Then just not efficient for, for hearing aids due to the to the size. 
So I think one thing, one thing we'll see as well is, is different power sources. We have all now announced uh, rechargeable uh, solutions uh, from our three companies. Uh, it has been said publicly that uh, Widex is, is working on and will be launching next year a, a fuel cell based hearing aid. So that is a, a hearing aid based on a fuel cell, driven by a fuel cell. And that's something we expect uh, quite much from because that's a totally different way to, to make sure there's power for, for the hearing aid. So no, no third one. Since they, that right. ended up not being a third one. Okay. I can probably okay. find a third one. No, no, that's fine. I was just imagining uh, the future uh, hearing aids will be very, very small and almost invisible, but the solar panels and the, the, the you know, the wind power that you have to have on your head to, to drive them making, will be... Making uh, them a little bit less discreet, but... Yes, uh, slightly, less. slightly less discreet, but, but uh, fashionable, I'm sure. So, um, there are so many things to talk about. Uh, one area that I'd like to, to, to delve into just a little bit, uh, changing focus slightly to a more industry um, uh, viewpoint. There's a lot of work going on right now in both small and, and uh, larger companies in an area of developing uh, in ear phones and uh, earphones with uh, with equalizers in build and stuff that's almost etching into some of the territory that that you're working in. What are your thoughts on things like the the hear and the doublers and the uh, some of the work that Apple's doing with their new AirPods and so on and so forth? What, what, how do you view that? Is that something that's uh, interesting? That's uh, uh, enlightening or threatening uh, when, when you look at that, or is it still too far away from, from your core business, uh, Ole? Um, I think it's a very interesting development. Um, and uh, if you were not looking deeply into it, I think uh, companies like us could uh, sort of, at the first view, be very nervous uh, about what, what is going on. Um, but then if you d dig into it, I think there are a couple of uh, things that uh, uh, the industry needs to, to deal with. First of all, um, the public thinks a hearing aid is a hearing aid. And uh, what you learn from the presentations today, there is so much innovation and knowledge that has not been, been discovered and built into the technology that there's a lot of improvement uh, in the future. But the public doesn't know that, and the policymakers don't understand it. They think a hearing aid was just uh, developed and it's become smaller and nicer. So therefore, it's just technology now, and uh, you need to, to provide that at a decent price. Um, if, if that happens, uh, that uh, the policymakers and the customers that buy our products do not see the difference between a hearable and a hearing aid, then you could say, uh, sort of roughly speaking, that we are toast. Uh, then uh, we, we are looking at a different way of working in our companies. Why is that? There are uh, Apple sells or sold 250 million uh, iPhones last year. Uh, they only have 20% of the market, roughly speaking. So it's about a million devices a year. And our industry is at the level of between 20, 10 and 20 mil, uh, million. So in terms of, of uh, you know, the, the muscle we have, uh, the uh, economies of scale and all that, we cannot compete. So uh, our, our competition is to continue to explore and prove that uh, you can do better with the technology that we develop for the people who have a problem. And a hearable is fine for a person that, as you, as you saw from, from Torsten and Uwe, that you, when you have your normal uh, hearing and, and brain facilities, it's when the hearing uh, falls us that uh, we come into the picture, and that's something else. And that will be important for us. Right. Uh, I'd like to get your, your answers as well. but. Uh, just you, you mentioned the word hearable a few times. Yes. Uh, I'm sure most of you have, have, uh, have heard that before, but just for, for the few who may have not, um, could you tell me what, what is a hear, hearable? Well, it's a good question. <laughs> um, in the future, I, are you, I'm, I'm sure that, that you've probably seen or heard about uh, 
Alexa from Amazon, uh, Google Home, uh, uh, devices where you speak into, literally speaking, the internet. And uh, it, you could imagine that a hearable is just a device sitting on the ear that gives you that kind of uh, control and access to the internet, along with uh, music streaming, uh, speaking on the phone, everything that you are used to doing with a smartphone or some, and another device like a PC or something like that. That, that, that today hearables are not quite there, but uh, it's not hard to imagine that an Alexa or a Google Home will be built into a, uh, a hearable in a very short time. There's no, nothing preventing that really. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. Right. So if any, any of you have seen the movie Her by Spike Jones, that's basically the idea. He has a small earplug with an integrated smart OS. Uh, he falls in love with it. Uh, hilarity in shoes. It's a very good movie. You should all see it if you haven't. Um, so that's a hearable, or at least the vision of a hearable, or yeah. one type of hearable. So going back to some of the well, challenges or interesting developments going on in the industry with uh, upcoming labs trying to, to do smart uh, any uh, headphones for uh, quote unquote normal hearing uh, people. Um, what, what, what is your take on that, well, Thomas? Uh, we'll, we'll begin well, with you. I, I agree uh, to some or to a large extent with, with Ola. I think at a, at a first glance you would, you would think, wow, somebody's coming to eat our lunch, and, and some of those companies are really big companies, as, you've, as you also stated, Ola. Uh, when, you, uh, when you look a little bit more, more into it, I think it's, it's more. Uh, it's more an opportunity than a challenge or more an opportunity than a threat for, for the hearing aid business. If we are still able to improve ourselves and improve our solutions to, to the end customers. The reason being that uh, there will be a lot of devices that can do some of uh, what was mentioned here and they will have a lot of different kind of sensors and uh, things that put into them that can do a lot of exciting things like pulse measurement or uh, stress measurement or what have you, um, they will probably not be focusing so much on the sound side because they will focus a lot on different technologies. We will still be able to do a lot more on the sound and the speech intelligibility by focusing on that. And therefore I think it will be, if people with say a mild hearing loss will go on by one of these, you also mentioned Doppler and uh, there is Eargo and a couple of others. Mm. It will probably be like buying the, um, uh, you know, the glasses at the gas station or the supermarket that, you know, it doesn't really fit you, it helps you a little bit, and you find out that it helps you a little bit, and then you want something that really helps you. So it could be a way to get customers into, to, if I may say so, real hearing aids. Right. So from that perspective, it's at first glance a threat, at second glance, if we do this right, I think it's, it's actually not deluding our business, but maybe helping a little bit. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? E yeah, I mean, I, I think both gentlemen said some, some really good things about it. I, I would like to add that one of the things that is maybe not so well understood is that to create a product that can sit on somebody in his ear for 16 hours without being a nuisance is not quite as easy as some people think it is. And in many headsets, I mean, if you wear a headset, there, there will be a, a moment, an hour later, where you really like to take it off, right? Because it's heating up inside and it's not that wonderfully comfortable to wear. Hearing aids sit on people. I mean, real hearing aid users use their hearing aids as people using glasses use their glasses. They take them on in the morning. They keep them on all day. They they listen through that. That is the new normal they have. I mean, this is really the critical bit of getting people to be happy hearing aid users is to convert them to this new reality, listening through hearing aids. If you take them on and off all the time, you will never develop if the, the full benefit of using them. And this is a little bit this notion that, you know, you would just pick up something and put it on your head when you need it, and then you will take it off when you don't need it anymore. There's not much evidence that this actually gets you to the point where you want to be. Uh, and, and I still think most of these devices that are created for music listening, even though you can put all sorts of capabilities into them, they will still signal to the world around you, I'm listening to something else. Maybe we will get used to this, that even though it looks like you're listening to something else, we can still talk to you, but 
it's not it's not intuitively so from the beginning. I mean, if if I see somebody with a headset on, I think he is listening to music. I will not think that he is trying to talk to me. And the same thing if you sit in a party situation, would you put on the big contraption on your head and sit oh, there yes. at a family dinner? <laughs> yes. Because you Every think time. that I will <laughs> help you in understanding what they say at the other side of the table. I, I must admit, personally, I find it hard to imagine, particularly because we know how concerned people that get their first hearing aid, how concerned they are about visibility of the device. They really don't like to be seen. So, so there are some, some sort of opposite forces here that are in play. So it is more complicated than it seems. And, and I know from our sister company and Thomas who remembers this well, the, the Bluetooth test, when they were introduced, the general thinking was, why wouldn't anybody in the world walk around with a Bluetooth headset? Great idea. But as we learned later on, it was actually not that many who wished to be seen in public with a Bluetooth headset. So, so all these factors are still, you know, making it less obvious than it may seem at a glance. Right. I, I don't think I've ever uh, encountered a problem that was less complex when you actually uh, went into it. So uh, <laughs> I guess th this is neither. But I just to, to then I I am. I, I sense we are pretty much in agreement about uh, the answer to your question. Uh, but then I would like to turn it around and say, well, uh, Nikolai is right. GN uh, were the first to offer uh, 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth low energy connectivity to an iPhone. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, that became a driver of uh, business in the market. and. Uh, I think the learning from that is that um, uh, if hearables or this access to the internet through uh, spoken and heard, uh, then uh, features that are in hearables will have to be found in hearing aids because people with a hearing loss will definitely want to have the same uh, possibilities as anybody else would mm -hmm. like to. Mm -hmm. So that's our challenge to, uh, you know, cover both areas, so to speak. Right. As, as other companies begin to integrate functions that yes. will, they'll, will become normal, they will also expect to find them in hearing aids. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and just uh, on a personal note to, to your comment before, Nikolai, uh, about visibility, I was just thinking that I would like uh, that there's a red light on my uh, earphones when I'm listening to music and a green light when I'm letting the, the outer world uh, through come, <coughs> come through. So that's a business idea that you can Thank make you. happen. Thank you. It's just a big red <laughs> flashing light that says, fuck, uh, sorry, uh, uh, go away and stop talking. Of course, there are solutions like that. Yeah. That would help. <laughs> but that's just an idea for yeah, you, for free. That's mm -hmm. fine. Um, so, uh, again, changing track slightly, since this is a track on, or an event on, on hearing and health, what do you see, if, if any, are the opportunities for, for your companies in broadening out, uh, integrating sensors that look at other types of, of health while you are having a small gadget uh, on your body at all times? Uh, I, I know there are already, uh, uh, you know, hearing uh, aids and, as well as Earpods with integrated uh, heart rate uh, sensors and so on and so forth. What, what do you see in, in the area of health uh, in terms of going forward, integrating sensors, new, new uh, types of algorithms and capabilities and so on? Um, Thomas, perhaps? Yes, I, I, think, I think that will happen. Um, we have our own ideas on, on what it should be first and next and, and so on. I'm, will not disturb you with those ideas. <laughs> um, but I also think it will be, it is, uh, back, to the, um, uh, back to what was just mentioned, you know, things from other uh, devices will also be, you know, expected to be found in hearing aids. The big challenge is, of course, every time you add something into it, it becomes bigger. Then technology advances, you know, it becomes smaller and smaller, and then you add something new and it becomes bigger again. So we are, we're constantly fighting this, uh, this size thing. If you look at hearing aids now, they're actually smaller than they were when I started in the industry. They were pretty big back then. Uh, but semiconductor technology has taken huge steps to, to make them smaller. Battery technology, not really. 
we've added radios, uh, digital uh, signal processing, and what have you, and still kept the size. And that, that, will, that will go on. But I don't think we will see them become smaller and smaller. I think they will sort of stay at the size that is acceptable. And then we will see a lot of different uh, sensors coming in over the years. And we have probably different views on what is most important and less important. What do you think is most important? Uh, that's what I said. I, I'm not sure oh, I would disturb anybody's thinking with that. <laughs> this is, this is a, a closed environment. Okay. Very, very right. much so. Very close. <laughs> yeah. No competitors, only, only nothing around. It. Right. In, in as much as you can say, Nikolai, what, what would you like to see in the, in the health department? It, it, it's not so easy to say exactly how we could sort of link to the health department. I mean, there are so many different conditions, and it's a bit difficult to imagine that we can cover sensors for all these different conditions. But I think the, there was, I mean, there's one obvious one that has been talked about quite a bit, that if you had some sort of acceleration sensor and a hearing aid, and an elderly person falls over and, you know, cannot get up again, the hearing aid would actually notice that that was this abrupt movement. And if this person remembered to bring the mobile phone with them, we should be able to send a signal to somebody that, you know, here is someone who needs help. Could be one such application for sensors, not really so health, but but still it's um, it's one opportunity. It's the healthcare. problem is a little bit that when you multiply all these, you know, the frequency of a given condition times elderly people in nursing home times, you know, it does become very small customer groups at the end of it. So that's a little bit another dimension to that. And just one about the size. I mean, the most common problem for people who newly acquire the hearing aid is how do I get it into the ear? I mean, it sounds a bit silly, but it's really true. This is the most frequently asked problem when you come back to, you know, you have to tell me once more, how is it, how do I get it into my ear? It, so making them even smaller is not going to be very helpful on that level. I mean, they are already rather small, and some people have a hard time manipulating them simply. Mm -hmm. So there are many right. practical issues that right. need to be taken care of here. Right. <laughs> Any input, uh, Ole? Yeah, I think, uh, again, you can, based on what I said before, divide it into two groups, what, what uh, could be interesting. Um, since I'm not an engineer, I can be more conceptual in my thinking. <laughs> and uh, you, 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 oh. you, yeah, disregarding mean, reality completely. Yes, that was my comment. So I, I, I think about that there are three systems. Uh, there's the environment with the sounds. There's the brain where the uh, understanding needs to to happen. And there's uh, the processing in the hearing aid, and and if you will, the damaged hearing system. And uh, uh, we don't know much about what goes on in the brain and uh, what optimizes brain performance. So the more we can, we can measure that, uh, and that, that could be many different things, uh, and I, I will not bother with you with that either, but uh, uh, that would be directly related to hearing aid performance, I think. Um, and then you have it, as it happens, where the, the point where a hearing aid is positioned is a very nice place uh, for a sensor to sit for, for many different things. And uh, whether you see uh, hearing aids offering uh, a uh, sensor for a Fitbit or a, uh, just on your, your smartphone or, and stuff like that, that's probably something that uh, could be uh, very okay. imaginable. Something uh, you mentioned, uh, looking at the, the brain functions as well, that was of yes. course something that Jason yeah. talked about earlier today. So I was just thinking that, of course, there's some challenges technologically uh, in terms of the hearing aids themselves. Will, will a solution or a way to go forward be to connect to other types of um, sensors and devices? Uh, already, of course, our phones, uh, hearing aids are connecting to our phones. Will that be a, a more viable way to go to to connect more to more types of devices and sensors and inputs, is that a, is that a way forward? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I think we are at least what I'm thinking about is something that is way out. But um, uh, we've seen uh, research centers uh, putting uh, what they call neural dust into the brains, into the nerve fibers, uh, and. Uh, if you could imagine that uh, that the hearing aid or some kind of device is a hub, 
uh, that links a uh, a number of sensors in in the body, uh, and uh, you know maybe also some kind of energy transfer system or whatever. You, you that there are many many different problems in this, uh, but that that could maybe open up for a, a new ways also of thinking about how do you get the uh, the signal into the brain. Why is it that we when we talk hearing aids, there are other technologies of course, but we have to pressure air into a uh, a damage system instead of finding other ways of uh, getting uh, the signal into the brain. Mm -hmm. right. you were. Yeah, no, I, I thought that was maybe, and I think this is um, certainly true. Uh, we will drill the first hole in your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would like to do that, I know. <laughs> please, I, I if if you do it, please do it on stage. Yeah. We are being filmed, yeah. so that would be great. For I thought another, another dimension we maybe should add to this is that since most hearing aids now from all manufacturers will have this 2.4 gigahertz radio, we can now program hearing aids using the same device on the table from a PC. But there is also an opportunity one day to generate systems or to establish systems where you can broadcast sound to hearing aids. So the, somebody talked about the loop systems in churches and things. It's a lot easier to put a little transmitter up on the wall that is sending out radio waves than it is to put a loop system in there. And, and Bluetooth, the Bluetooth system is being asked to produce a broadcasting protocol. They have not been too receptive so far because they are very happy with this sort of handshake protocol that I'm talking to some other device and we know each other. But, but there's technically nothing preventing them from doing a broadcast protocol. So we could put up little transmitters everywhere. And anybody with a hearing aid should be able to receive messages. I mean, think about train stations, the pet example. Nobody can understand what they say in the loudspeaker. If they were to get that directly into their ears through a hearing aid, they would be actually at a big advantage compared to most other people in these situations. You could do the same in you know, offices, in taxis, everywhere where people are having trouble communicating. Uh, and I think it will happen. I know the, I mean, the Bluetooth people are a little slow getting there because some of the established Bluetooth players are a bit concerned about their business model. But nevertheless, the hearing aid industry has proposed this and is pushing it, and I think it will probably happen. And then we would see situations where you could say, as a hearing aid user, you would be better off than the other guys, which could lead to a situation where these hearable devices may be another interesting addition to your range of personal right. things. So that could guide you in unknown places and tell you where the nearest coffee shop is and all these things. So there are some interesting opportunities in that so field. It's, it's augmented reality or audio augmented yeah, reality. But in beginning with, with people with hearing aids, but possibly spreading out because it's an interesting function and who wouldn't want that? Except, of course, when it, it gets hacked and you get uh, ads blown <laughs> into your head at maximum volume wherever exactly. you go. But, but that's that, another that's, challenge. Yeah. This is actually why we would suggest that this is created for hearing aid users under some degree of control. With yes. only ads from your own companies no, being... No, with, with no ads. Oh, okay. That's right. Um, <laughs> Oh, I, I agree to, to what right. the gentlemen have said. I also think that, that you will see, you know, different companies trying different combinations of what can we combine the hearing aid with. Now we have this 2.4 gigahertz uh, connection possible, so what can we do with that? A lot of different things. It's, it's just, you know, trying things out, and I think you will see different ideas on, on what could be nice to to um, have in connection with your hearing aids on your body. Right. Uh, or close to your body. Right, so we have a few minutes, uh, and I think it would be interesting for, for you guys perhaps also to, to uh, ask questions if you have any. I think we have a mic um, floating around the room, so I'd like to open up for, for a few questions if it's okay with you. And uh, please uh, let us know who you are, and, and let's keep the questions uh, pretty brief. Uh, I think we have the first one over here. Thank you. So now I'm dealing with, uh, with vision and not hearing. But uh, now we have had the pacemaker for many years. Uh, when will you operate something into the head, not have an external device? But you, you can actually get implantable hearing aids today. Okay. But, but it is normally a solution that is used for people with very, very severe hearing problems where hearing aids are, are in, enabled to, to do the job. 
because you, you do get an electrode in there with about 20 stimulation points. So that's a little bit like, you know, taking a full piano and folding it into 20 keys. Yeah, so you don't, get, you don't get the full picture. I mean, you do get something that is fantastic for people that has no hearing, but, but it is a very reduced information set that you, and you need to retrain your brain to understand how to use this to the best. So it's not that easy, but you can get these solutions where they become so fantastic that you could use it for everyone. I find that a little hard to believe. At least for not, in the near term. not in the near term, definitely. Not in the near term, also, right. I mean, it does take surgery to do that. Yeah. I think most people would still rather wear something on their ear than go through surgery in yeah. their brain. It's, it's not quite plug and play. It's, it's not surgery. really. No. <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> not, not quite. <laughs> Un unless you get a drill to, to all his head and then it'll be. Right. Another question. Hi. My name is Vishal Tisodia. I'm from a startup company, Sumondo. My question is related to Yen's comment where he said uh, for AI, uh, you need a lot of data. So my question is to all the panel members, are you guys open for, for open devices for this AI? Because you need a lot of data. And for that, it has to be open in some way so that uh, AI-based solution could be implemented. Of course, you have very less uh, hearing aid market, but still it will be nice if, if it could be open. Yeah, so how are you handling data, sharing data, having open data for, for AI to be able to create better algorithms is sort of the question here. If you could uh, address that, please. Well, I think there are two, two stages to that. Uh, as, uh, uh, Nikolai said the uh, the industry has a long track record for trying to further that uh, standards are generated and uh, as, lo as soon as something becomes a standard then uh, we would adhere to that uh, that's been should I say a tradition within the industry um, for if you go beyond that for something special I would at least uh, say for, for the company I work for then uh, we would uh, have to enter into some kind of business agreement in order to uh, get to that point. Anything to add? Yeah, I think it, it's clear that commercial activities uh, by Google and Facebook and all these other guys are generating enormous amounts of data that people apparently give away for free because they get something in return. Uh, when you talk about hearing issues and hearing data, it's no, normally considered medical, which means that there are a lot of security measures around it that you can't just give away people's hearing data. So each user should then, you know, sign off, say, I would happily donate any data on my, my situation to a public pool, which is maybe possible, but there, there are some complications about it. And I would say also that some of the data is very related to our particular device and, and as such not very useful to anybody else but us. So then you could say the data could be sort of two categories. One is what is the public part of it, which may be where are people moving, what sound environment are they in and such. But the, the actual data and how the hearing aid runs is, is really hard for anybody else to make much sense out of, I would say. We have another question here on row two. Camilla Afman, mother to a child with a hearing aid. Um, I just have a question. How much are you into co-creation? I know that you're using adults, but uh, as a mother uh, to a child, there's not much co-creation. And also the collective of data. You could actually you know, ask uh, people or members of Disabel or whatever. I mean, you go back and forth if it's old kind of edicts we have for the children. I mean, I guess you kind of could use your, your data doing something, um, but what is your co-creation on, on, on children or not just adults? Right. Well, I'm not sure that I understand what co-creation means in this particular context. You have to develop um, the hearing aid for kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you ever ask parents, I mean, do you ask the kids, because the kids can answer yes. the right answers, so you ask parents to co-create mm. with the kids. Ah, that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, 
We, we do. I think we all do. Yeah. So uh, if you feel that you would like to participate, then uh, contact us. I think that goes for anyone of us. Yeah, Okay, I think you should just grab hold of, of the, these <laughs> yeah. guys afterwards because that was an invitation. I heard an invitation. Yeah. So. Yes. Please do. Uh, back row here, please. Yes, my name is Frederick. Um, I have two questions for all of you. First, uh, how do you deal with the, or what are some of your strategies to deal with the stigma and uh, to reach the younger demographics? Uh, and two, um, the, the OCT Hearing Aid Act that was uh, passed last, uh, last month, I think, in the, or by the U.S. Senate. Will that, uh, or how will you respond to that? Uh, since, for example, companies like Doppler Labs will, will suddenly be able to market their products as, as hearing aids. Yeah. I, I, think, I think, actually, if, if I may, and I may because I'm the moderator, sure. um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm giving myself permission. Let's let's focus on question number two. Um, what will this mean in, in terms of your future going forward? Uh, competition challenges from from startups and newcomers and so on. Because I, I think that's perhaps most uh, 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 looking towards the future uh, for your businesses. So a few comments on that, and I think we'll we'll have to call that the last question. Okay. So I I think it's it's a little bit back to uh, to what I said earlier. I think not being arrogant or ignorant about what's going on because it, it may have big implications. I think as, as we see it uh, right now is, yes, there will, be, uh, there will be other companies like you mentioned Doppler Labs, there's Ergo, there's a number of others. Uh, even Bose have now a, uh, a uh, headset that can uh, function as a hearing helper. Mm -hmm. um, so we will see different companies coming into the space close to, uh, close to us. It is still only for what's called mild to moderate uh, hearing losses, which is also a large pool of hearing losses. Acknowledge that. Um, but again, I think if if we do the right thing, I think it's more an advantage because it it will get some people earlier to try out some kind of hearing help. They will probably need something more, and they will come to the uh, to one of the manufacturers. Uh, there's a good chance that it's one of us because we represent 50% of the world market in total, three of us. So, so from that perspective, I think it's, it's neutral to, to kind of slightly positive. Uh, but of course, it's something we monitor closely because uh, it, could, it could take off in a different direction uh, where it would be more like a threat. But, but right now, that's not how we see it. Uh, a few pieces of facts here. Um, in the United States, there is very little insurance coverage or public support for hearing aids. So most people have to buy them themselves. In contrast to several European countries where you can get hearing aids almost without any payment. And, and interestingly, Denmark is the country in the world that has the highest coverage with hearing aids in, in when you, for the size of the population. Uh, you can estimate around 50 some percent of anybody who has recognized he has a hearing problem or she has a hearing problem, is using a hearing aid in Denmark. In, in the U.S., it's much lower. And, and so therefore, the driver behind this has also been to give a more affordable solution, they say. And what has to be noticed as well is that this is not new. For the past 20 years, there has been a huge market alongside the regular hearing aids selling all sorts of amplifier systems called personal sound amplifiers, PSAPs. The general belief is there are about 500,000 to a million of these sold every year, and they are hearing aids. They're just not marketed as hearing aids. So whether it's going to create such a huge change that this now become an official category, I, I'm not so sure. Honestly. Right. Okay. But if any, yeah, I, comment? I think it's a complex story made short. Uh, the bill is because the politicians think that affordability and accessibility will drive up uh, the acceptance of hearing aids. Uh, over time, many, many, many centuries, or not centuries, but decades, the penetration of hearing aids has not changed at all in industrialized countries. There has to be a certain level of economy in a country before it, it gets to a, a place where people have, can afford it. 
But even if you can afford it, you may not want it. And that's the stigma part you, you're talking about. Stigma is many different things. The number uh, Nikolai mentioned is, is, you know, we can discuss what the penetration is. Uh, but in Denmark, we also have uh, a lower satisfaction with hearing aids compared to the US, and there are more instruments in the drawer that are not being used. So um, what I think people fail to recognize is that uh, when you have to have people persuaded that it's a good idea for them to have hearing aids, there is some level of counsel necessary. And uh, maybe that change, the, the idea of what counseling is will gradually change, but it's not a disruptive change. We don't see that at least. So uh, uh, we don't see this as something that uh, is going to be a, a new revolution that uh, is a big threat to our Right. Our so life. no panic, uh, I guess, is the final yeah. word. Um, Careful attention. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the speakers. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, uh, first of all, to you uh, in the audience for coming to this uh, track by the Danish Sound Innovation Network. Um, if you want to know more, I'm sure you can talk to, uh, to Jimmy. Um, about that or visit uh, danishsound.org. And also I mentioned uh, the reception. Uh, there's a keynote going on right now. I think it's a bit late for that, so come to the reception instead. Uh, it's hosted by Vidix and Oticon at stand 15 or thereabouts, I think, in the expo area. Um, and I'm sure all of you will have, lo have lots to, to chat about. So thank you for coming, and let's give our speakers and panel uh, a final hand. Thank you. Thank you.